But this is, again, it's like the least thing I'm going to be worrying about in a zombie apocalypse. I'm going to be worried about the zombies. What do you think? I like turtles. All right, you're great zombie. And Today's video is sponsored by Surfshark. More on them in a bit. Hello everybody, welcome back to another episode of Brain Blaze. This one, the lost skills of yesterday, scuff, stuff we used to be able to do, but forgot. Honestly, probably forgot for a good... Uh, on these things like, yeah, well, we used to... We used to be able to go from the south to the north of the country and we'd all learn the roads. It's like, yeah, but we... Like... I get that why that's useful, but are we ever going to live in a world and not some like post-apocalyptic thing because like really is probably not going to happen where all the GPS satellites are down and there's nothing where you have to read maps. It's never going to happen. Never going to happen. <laughs> so I don't need to know this. I have no desire to learn this. Like, I don't even look at road signs anymore because it's just like turn left. You're like, okay, get in the left lane. Okay. <laughs> like, let's get rid of all the road signs. We don't need those. There's... Like, that will be extremely beneficial. <laughs> Saves lots of money. Like, no having to put up all the road signs. Also, if a country gets invaded, then uh, there's no there's no sign. You just, you know, take down GPS or whatever. Somehow. Like, hack the mainframe. I don't know. Well, that's a good idea, isn't it? Just take the, or, like, put up wrong road signs. <laughs> One day in the far future, new episodes of Brain Blaze will be scripted and edited by AI. Can't wait. <laughs> Kevin, your days are numbered! And presented by a deepfake version of Simon Whistler. Oh no! My days are numbered! This, they tell me, will be progress. Yeah, honestly, then I'm just gonna go chill. But I guess I won't be being paid either, so the chilling will quickly turn into like, oh god, I need money to chill. Ah. In fairness, the ChatGPT scriptwriter won't accidentally drift into deeply irrelevant 20-minute intro. The AI editor won't fall asleep at the bleep button, and the deepfake Simon will be able to say the word effortlessly with... And the deepfake Simon will be able to say the word effortlessly, effortlessly. Pfft. Boom! Nailed it. Nailed it. Maybe I am the AI. Maybe I've already deepfaked myself. Maybe I've got access to future technology. No. I don't think so. In this bleak future, of which I speak, barely any human will be capable of writing a script, editing a video, or doing whatever it is that Simon is supposed to be doing. Or seen, or I'll be able to do, Kevin. It'll be, I'll be able to type into it, shorten that introduction. Won't I, Kevin? Won't I? Won't I, Kevin? <laughs> Wait, did Kevin write this? Who wrote this? It feels like Kevin, but I'm not sure if he signed his name at the top there, and he normally does. Maybe Danny wrote this. There's no name on this. Is this Danny or Kevin? I'm going to go look this up. I have to say, it feels like Kevin, but now I've got a Danny vibe. Ooh. Seventy-five years later. Danny, I'm so sorry. Kevin, I'm sorry as well. I should have known by the length of the introduction that it was Danny. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> Ah! Technology will have eradicated the need and stuff like this will join the long list of lost skills from yesteryear. Maybe there's no such thing as a truly lost skill. There are always people out there who still prefer to do things the old-fashioned way. It's just that many of the essential life skills that everyone used to learn are now considered to be largely unnecessary in the modern world. Thanks to advances in technology and improvements in efficiency, there's no great need for little Timmy to learn how to track and hunt animals, butcher a carcass, forage for food, start a fire with sticks, dig a well, or rewind a cassette. Yeah, no one needs this stuff. This is all complete. There's never going to be a time when cassettes are going to be necessary. Hold up. Wait a minute. But one concern here is the human race used to be entirely self-sufficient, yet now we're happy for technology to shoulder all of the responsibility. Yeah, it's all like, right, of course. I mean, when we make this argument, I'm sure Danny's going to be like, oh, you know, this is really good. And I'm like, I'm totally happy to let technology shoulder the responsibility. Like, this is being recorded on a camera with a little hard disk plugged into it. I'm not, like, spooling up film and, like, having a dude being like, okay, Simon, and now we're going for take seven and wheeling some, like, giant thing. That's how shit used to work in the past, right? <laughs> like, I don't know. Because of, I mean, technology's awesome. What would happen in the event of a catastrophic disaster crippling the power grid and leaving us to fend for ourselves again? I don't know. We'll be fine. We'll figure it out. Or, or we'll die. Look, you know what they say? Safety first. I'm always saying that to my kids, actually. But it's more about them riding a bike rather than them, you know, being aware about data and stuff online. But you're an adult, so you have to worry about different kinds of safety, and that's what Surfshark VPN provides. They mask everything you do online, keeping you safe and private. It's like wearing pants. All the important stuff stays private and secure. 
which is nice. Surfshark VPN lets you virtually travel the world, accessing different content libraries and getting the best deals when shopping online. You can even access your bank safely on public Wi-Fi. And if you thought, oh yeah, I would just do that anyway, just go to Starbucks, <laughs> bank.com. Don't do that. I mean, you can do that, but get Surfshark VPN. But it's not just about convenience and safety. Surfshark VPN also provides added security features like Surfshark Alert, Antivirus, and Search. And with a strict no-logs policy and 100% RAM-only servers, you can rest assured that your data is always safe. And the best part? You can use Surfshark VPN on unlimited devices with just one subscription. That means you can share with all your friends and pay less than a piece of gum for a more secure and private online life. Try out Surfshark VPN at surfshark.deal slash Blaze, and with its 30-day money-back guarantee, you are sure to be sure that you like it. Also, use that promo code Blaze, and you'll get 83% off in an extra three months for free, which is nice. There's a link below, and now back to today's video. Whatever, it doesn't mean that I'm going to learn all the skills just in case. <laughs> We'd be running around like lost lemmings and surely starving to death while complete whilst complaining that we can't get decent Wi-Fi. Maybe it's time for us to rediscover just a few of those forgotten arts from the days of yore. Oh my god, the intro's finally over five minutes in. Jesus Christ. <laughs> Jesus Christ, struck down these intros. Step inside the memory palace. It blows my fragile modern mind how I can easily recall my old family home landline from when I was around ten years old. Me too. I was just running it. I was going to read it out loud, but obviously that would be not very responsible. <laughs> like, I mean, my parents, it's like a house that, God, I don't know, I lived in as a kid. <laughs> but you don't, like, I just read that out as a random stranger or just get a phone call. Along with at least five of my closest friends that I used to hang around with at the time. Yeah, same. I can also remember their numbers as well. Like, at least, can I? Oh, no, those are kind of fading on me. No, I don't really remember those. I mean, I can remember bits of them, but I wouldn't feel confident. That reminds me, I really should give Chip Shop Barry a bell to see if he's coming out to play. <laughs> oh, it's Chip Shop Barry there. Who the f is Chip Shop Barry? <laughs> He moved out 20 years ago, Danny. Nowadays, I couldn't recite the telephone number of any of my family or closest friends. It took me about, yeah, I don't even know my wife's mobile number. And she's like, yeah, I memorized your number just in case I'm stuck somewhere and my phone's out of battery and I need to call you. And I'm like, that's probably a good idea. I should probably memorize that. I sometimes also wonder if there's someone to be like, what's your phone number? I'll be like, uh, yes, I got it. Okay, I'll tell you. I don't. No. But taking this several levels deeper, is the human memory not as good as it used to be? And did the introduction of the printing press really make us lose all of our memories? Of course, the reason that we don't memorize telephone numbers anymore is because we don't need to. We just don't need to dial the correct sequence to make the call. Or we can all leave the complicated stuff to the mobile phone after we've clicked a button to save a new contact. So much easier. But a worrying side effect of handing over all of this burden to technology is that you could become potentially screwed in a crisis. If your own mobile phone was lost or damaged during an emergency situation, would you know the telephone number of any of your emergency contacts? My wife would be like, yes. And I'd be like, no. <laughs> Someone from a period as recent as the 1980s, I'd be like, well... I guess I got to get to an internet cafe somehow and try and remember my passwords, which are also handled by technology because they're all like a password manager, aren't they? <laughs> This will be a disaster. I'll be like, well, I guess I'm screwed. It's time to start a new life. Someone from a period as recently as the 1980s would be fine as long as they could find a phone booth as they'd have all the important numbers stored in their head. But somebody in trouble today suffering the side effects of digital amnesia is unlikely to have the foggiest clue. Realistically, nobody in the modern age is expected to store a mental Rolodex of every phone number that they might ever use, but it's recommended that you at least try and memorize the numbers of your crucial emergency contacts. The best way of doing this, I think if I was stuck outside, I'd be like, okay, am I going to figure this out? Okay. Well, uh, do I have any money, though? Not having money is a big issue, because then you'd be like, well, how am I going to get money? I would kind of be screwed. I'd kind of be a little bit screwed. I think you can go into the bank and show, but then you've got to show your ID. I have no idea what I'd do. Hello, how are you? I am under the water. Please help me. I should sort it, but then if you don't have any money, what are you supposed to do? Hi, can I borrow your phone? To a stranger on the street. I am I, I'm way too like not comfortable doing that to do that. Go into a play, place of business and be like, hi, I need to make a phone call. It's a local number. I would not be comfortable doing that. I don't know what I'd do. I'd guess I'd just go home and stand outside my apartment until 
my wife comes home, at whatever point that might be. Or I'd go to one of my friends' houses and just hope they're in. Not that I really necessarily remember. Like, I live in a city, so it's not like you know exactly where your friend's house is. It's like, hey, did he live on that street or that street? Because you just go there by GPS. <laughs> oh my god, I'm just realizing how Danny's correct and I take it all back. I'm going to go learn my wife's phone number. But then what would I do? I wouldn't have any money to make a phone call. And where do I make a phone call? There are no phone booths. Well, we're fucked. Maybe I'll just get a spare phone and hide it somewhere? But then it's not going to be charged, is it? Oh my god. The best way of doing this is to make sure you only dial those numbers manually by hand until you've reached a point where you're f when you've fully absorbed them. Or just memorize them. It's not that hard. Just be like, okay, I'm going to memorize this number. It's only nine digits. Or however many digits are phone numbers are in other countries. It's not that hard. I've been testing out this method recently and it only took about three weeks for me to completely memorize the phone numbers for Granny Wobble's Fudge Pantry and Sweaty Joe's Greasy Kebab Parlor. Now, <laughs> kebab parlor. Parlor sounds so fancy next to the word kebab. So I'm pretty much fully prepared if it ever hits the fan. On the whole, maybe it's a good thing that we don't need to fill up our memory space with a big bunch of numbers anymore. Or we can now use that space to remember all of the many different passwords that we use for all our different online logins, which I'm sure we're all very good at. No, because everyone uses a password manager daddy but it's possible that people from thousands of years ago would have no trouble at all in remembering every telephone number that you'd have ever needed if only the telephone had been invented a bit earlier and i realized my initial plan of going to like finding an internet cafe or if you don't have any money going to like a library and sitting down at one of their computers which i'm sure are disgusting and i'd never touch <laughs> i don't know maybe libraries are not that bad i'm a bit like not into touching things um a little bit of that going on like the not like, is it germophobia i just don't like like i'll use my jacket on the handles and stuff i'm just not into that and i but i'd you know bite the bullet i'm going to the library I'd, and then i realized well you know you'll be like okay well i'm just gonna log into my email because that i'll find a phone number in there that i can call or i'll log into my skype or some shit like that and it'll work out on my iCloud and then I realize, oh, but I don't know any of these passwords. Like, well, I'll just log into my password marriage. And then it's like, yeah, but use two-factor authentication. And then you're like, then that's on the phone. I had no idea this episode would lead to such strong ranting. God, I'm totally convinced, Danny. You're so right. Let's all go back to the past. I won't be here no more. Take, take me back. And that's because their memory skills are quite remarkable in comparison to our own. Long before the use of writing became widespread in ancient Greece, the only way of passing on teachings or stories was orally. And so you needed to have an amazing memory to get everything right. It's speculated that the works of Homer weren't actually written down for the first time until hundreds of years after Homer first recited them. So their existence today is only down to the bards who memorized every line of the original epic works and passed them down the generations. Even as late as the medieval period, it wasn't uncommon for troubadours to perform works which I went on for hours or even days all recited entirely from memory shadows creep and and phantoms leap brilliant I know it's a gift Speaking as someone who would struggle to accurately recite just one segment from the last Brain Blaze script, I find this quite incredible. We're back in the pre-printing press days when handwritten books were hard to come by, having a good memory was essential for anyone who wanted any kind of education. Yeah, I think Danny titled this section The Memory Palace. Just learn how to do a memory palace and then you can remember whatever you want. I must have brought up this story before. I once just memorized pi to like a hundred and something digits using a memory palace. It's not even hard. It just takes like, uh, you just okay done it's not I, remember, I was on a skiing holiday and on the ski lifts i was just doing that you know when you're waiting to go up and you're just like mm, 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 mm. and i was like cool let's just do this and i did that i've told this story before i'm sure um but it's just not that hard it's probably how i remember my wife's phone number in a minute you just come up with three items that's enough for nine digits and boom easy done they had a few tricks up their sleeveless tunics to help them along the way the most notable of which was the memory palace or the mind palace or the method of loki Ioki, or I don't know. Uh, that's a capital, like, you know, capital L, uh, capital I and L look the same, so I'm not sure what that word is supposed to be, but it doesn't matter. Let's just move on. This is a mental strategy in which you visualize a familiar building, such as your own home, and then assign specific items of information to specific locations. By then taking a mental stroll through this memory palace, you can swiftly recall or find the information by visiting the location where you planted it to trigger the memory. Yeah, it's amazing, and that's it. That's all you need to know. 
you now know how to do a memory palace. There's nothing to it more than that. And you can just go, you can do like literally hundreds of items. And then you can move on to another, like your workplace, an old house, your, uh, I don't know, places you're just very familiar with. And then you can just go make more memory palaces and it's incredible. However, the memory palace largely came tumbling down in popularity with the invention of Gutenberg's printing press in the 15th century, after which the printed page took care of storing the details on our behalf. In fact, the memory palace was widely forgotten for hundreds of years, although it made a relatively recent comeback, albeit largely restricted to performers showcasing amazing feats of memory, which were quite commonplace in the olden days. But still, it would be wrong to suggest that people from ancient Greece or the medieval era had superior memories. The human brain hasn't had enough time to evolve or devolve. <laughs> and we're still very capable of memorizing long reams of information, even if these days it's more likely to involve film trivia, sporting results, and the chart positions of every UK single released by Duran Duran. Okay, Danny, you do you. It's just that most of us have never learned the skills of training our memory, which were so essential to get along in the olden days. Incidentally, the Greek philosopher Socrates would have hated the printing press. He never wrote anything down as he was strongly against the new fad of writing. <laughs> Socrates felt philosophy couldn't be effectively communicated through written words and that writing would ultimately be harmful to the human memory and the soul. Okay. All that writing has destroyed society. His disciple Plato was in complete agreement, although he took time to write down the dialogues of Socrates anyway. Really, bitch? And so the only reason we know anything about the teaching of Socrates at all is because Plato wrote down the reasons why we shouldn't be writing anything down. <laughs> Classic Plato. Bellend. Food preservation. This is not so difficult these days. You just figure out which food products need to be shoved in the fridge or freezer and quickly check if the canned beef burgers with gravy are still good only a few years past their sell-by date. But you only have to go back a few generations before the invention of refrigeration and freezers and before the arrival of complex food distribution systems to discover a world in which every designated cook of the household, okay, I'll say it with reluctance, housewife, was required to be an expert in a long list of preservation techniques. You don't have to say it with reluctance, Danny. The past was a thing. Like, we don't need to rewrite the past, we just need to learn from it. Like, it was bad. It was bad. Like, there were many things wrong with it. That's okay. Hashtag cancel Simon. Long before you could nip to the supermarket and pick up out of season food products running thousands of miles away, yeah, sometimes I'll just be eating strawberries in winter and they're just delicious and you're like, this shit's crazy. Like, strawberries, it's November. Love that shit. Love that shit. And I know it's bad for the environment or anything, but it's just like, oh, but they're so tasty. It's going to destroy the earth for the funny. It's so tasty. If you don't want me to buy them, make them more expensive and I won't buy them. I'm so tax them somehow more, like to punish us. But my God, like, it's crazy, isn't it? Just don't. Do it! Families had to squeeze every advantage from the food seasons by stocking up big time on supplies and preserving the food before it had a chance to break down and spoil. Ancient man had it particularly hard. Archaeologists have recently unearthed cakes of ancient butter, which had been buried in bogs in Ireland and Scotland to help keep them fresh. <laughs> I know it's a good idea, but it's like, where's the butter? Oh, it's in the bog out back. <laughs> it's kind of gross. Why does it taste all peaty? That's not meatball soup. That's my collection of fur balls and stomach acid. It wasn't a bad tactic. Even thousands of years after the burial, the archaeologists reckon that this bug bog butter is still theoretically edible, but advise against smearing it on your toast. In later years, every household was more likely to preserve their food by mastering the art of drying, salting, smoking, cellaring, jellying, fermenting, pickling, and various other methods ending with an ing. I got that out first time. God damn, Simon. Your ability to read the teleprompter is occasionally top-notch. None of these techniques sound terribly difficult. I reckon I could figure out how to pickle an onion if push came to shove. And thanks to the invention of canning in 1810, I'm not convinced that we all need to relearn the lost skills of food preservation anyway. Come the nuclear apocalypse, I'm going to quite happily be munching away on huge stockpile of Fray Bento's pies. Succulent chunks of meat encased in golden flaky pastry sounds like a superior menu option to a chunk of bog butter or a jar of fermented cabbage. It's just a bit of a shame that after going to the trouble of inventing canning, nobody thought to invent the can opener until almost 50 years later. Is that true? I thought that was an urban legend, but that's great if it's true. That's a hell of a long time to wait to get inside a Frey Bento's pie. Changing a car tire. I've never done this. I only had to need to do this twice in my life, and both times I didn't have a spare tire, because one was a rental car, and one was my car before last. And instead of having like a um, spare tire, 
I was like, okay, let's open up the boot because I got like a flat tire on the motorway or whatever. And I'm like, okay, let's see. And I was like, oh, there is no spare tire under this thing. There's no space for a spare tire. It was just not included with the car, but they had this like puncture repair kit. And I'm like, okay. And then it was completely useless because it wasn't like a, it wasn't like a nail in there or whatever. Something had like, I, there was something on the motorway or whatever. There must have been. I don't really know what caused it, but there was like a slash, like a, not like a slash, but a tear in the tire. And I was abroad, and so I wasn't covered by, like, whatever my, um, what's it called? Like, the AA? AAA? Is that what you have in America? Like, the people who come pick you up by the side of the road. So it wasn't covered, and I paid, like, 300 euros <laughs> for a German. I was in Germany for a German dude to come pick up my car and then take me to a tire shop where they didn't have the correct tire size. So they had put a tire on my car that was too small. And it, it was fine. The car, like, adapts to this somehow. But it meant the cruise control didn't work. So I was driving on the motorway for hours without cruise control. Which, when you've had cruise control forever, you're like, oh, my God. So much attention has to be paid all the time for hours. <laughs> uh, that, was a, that was painful. Fascinating tangent, Simon. Let's carry on. I'm hardly in a position to criticize here, as I've never even learned how to legally drive a car, never mind change a tire in emergency. Legally drive. Sounds like Danny's just illegally driving all the time, doesn't it? But I was surprised to hear that this is an evolving this is evolving into a lost skill, even though it's apparently relatively easy. If you go back a few decades, oh there was another time. <laughs> There was another time and I had a spare tire and everything. And I was like, okay, cool, I can figure this out. So I get out the jack and I'm like jacking up the car. And it's like crunch. And it wasn't my car. It was my parents-in-law car, which is like this really old car. And so I'm like doing it. And I'm just like, it's just like, like pushing into the rust. And I'm like, uh, just because this isn't my car, I'm just going to phone and be like, the car is incredibly rusty underneath. Do you think it's okay to like be doing this thing? And they're like, it was like five minutes away and uh, my father-in-law was like, yeah, yeah, I'll come down and have a look at it. <laughs> and he's like, yeah, let's just go. And it's like, just crunches through the rust. <laughs> it's like, okay. <laughs> Swaps out the tire, easy does it. If you go back, it's like there's three times and no, I've never done it. So I guess I am in the lost skill of not being able to do this, even though I'm fairly sure I can figure it out. Also, you just be like looking up a YouTube video on how to do it, easy. If you go back a few decades, only men drivers were expected to know how to change a flat tire. Women were supposed to just stand at the roadside and look helpless. But nowadays, men are equally likely to have adopted this skill of standing at the roadside and looking helpless, or at least call for professional roadside assistance, which has improved dramatically over the last few decades. Also, you're just, aren't you much less likely to have a tire pop? Well, oh, I've had it happen to me three times, so I guess it's not that unlikely. According to a 2018 poll conducted by British TV show Flipping Bangers, whilst almost half of the respondents aged over 36 felt confident about changing a car tire, almost three quarters of millennials reckon that they wouldn't know where to start. Despite this, the same poll revealed that more young drivers than old drivers are rated their knowledge of car maintenance as excellent. <laughs> It's the ignorance of ignorance, which perhaps tells its own story. Oh boy, does it. This one is unusual as it does it. It's pro this is exactly what I just said, isn't it? I'm, the, I'm a millennial myself and I just realized, I was like, oh, figure this out. How hard can this be? This one is unusual as it doesn't appear to have anything to do with advances in technology making an old skill obsolete. It's more to do with a general vibe that young people now seem to prefer to leave the dirty work to specialists who know what they're doing rather than tackling anything themselves. Which I completely agree with. Like, anything, like, maintenance-wise, I just don't do. Like, I have a man. And we phone him up, and he comes to the house. And he'll fix it. And it's like, like my dishwasher broke. My boiler broke. And it's like, well, yeah, there's people who do this. You phone them up, you pay them some money, and they fix that shit. And most of the time, it's not something I could fix anyway. Why didn't you just call the guy? Like, no, not my dishwasher. My dryer broke. And it was making, it was, or it was just making this crazy sound. It's like, Wee! Like, any time it was dry and stuff. And the man comes around and he's like, yeah, the motor's gone. I could never have fixed that. It's a motor. He takes out this giant motor. He puts in a new motor. He charges me a large amount of money and he leaves. Like... I couldn't have done this. What do you want from me? <laughs> the same poll revealed that a third of millennials wouldn't even feel confident about opening the car bonnet. Oh, come on. I at least know how to do that. Like, I don't know how to fix anything in there. But I don't want to be the person who's like, the car breaks down and you're like, well, I guess we'll just call the AA. I at least want to be able to go to the front of the car, pop the thing open and be like, poke around a little bit, pretend that I know what's going on and be like, gonna have to call the AA. This is a little bit beyond me. <laughs> And then the AA man will be like, you just needed more coolant. Oh, no. 
<laughs> oh no. Um, well, nearly nearly half don't know how to top up their screen rush. Okay, that's a little bit embarrassing, guys. You should know how to do that. Maybe not, although not that I really have to do it, because every time you send in the car to get serviced, they put new screen wash in there. I think I only had to do this once when I was like took a really long drive and the dirt it was always getting dirty. I was constantly using it, it ran out. And they had to put a new one in there. It wasn't hard to figure out. But almost every other time, they just do it when you send it for service. I don't know. Moving away from the vehicle, millennials are also showing similar disinterest in learning basic DIY skills. Twice as many older people will attempt to fix a leaky tap. Yeah, no chance. No, no idea how to do that. Oh, whilst three times as many feel confident about changing a plug. I don't think you're legally allowed to change plugs anymore. I think they made that illegal. And also, you can't change, like, European plugs. That you, you don't change those. They're just how they are. Also, in comparison to older generations, dramatically fewer millennials would be able to put up a shelf, unblock a sink, bleed a radiator, change a light bulb, or presumably wipe their own bottom. Things I can do from that list. Unblock a sink, I've done that. Bleed a radiator, I've done that. Change a light bulb, done I've done all of this stuff! I've even wiped my own bottom! All of this would seem to indicate a prosperous future for breakdown cover providers, plumbers, and professional light bulb changers. The only reason I bled a radiator is because one time like, my boiler was making some crazy-ass sounds. And um, it was, you know, that pressure thing was just in the red. And I was just like, oh my God, this is going to blow up. So I Googled it and it told me how to bleed a radiator and I bled my radiator and the pressure just kept going up. My anus is bleeding! So I was like, we need to call the emergency plumber, the emergency boiler man, who's even more expensive. And he came and he fixed it and it was super expensive. And now my boiler works. And the boiler man came around the other day, is increasing problems with the boiler. And he's like, it's 12 years old. That's why you're going to need to replace it. I'm like, the boiler only lasts 12 years. It looks so new. And he's like, yeah, yeah, it's going to be about, they're, they're like a grand at least British. It's, it's a lot. And I was I'm, I'm also just having to buy another boiler for a house. Ah. Ah, oh, so many boilers. So many expensive boilers. I even just read the boiler. This sounds like, I know this sounds like such a douche problem, but it's like, and I also just had to replace the boiler in my office. And I know, I know people are like, Simon, that just means you have three properties. And I'm like, I am aware, but it is also very expensive to be replacing boilers all the time. Cry me a river fact, boy. Just make sure you've remembered all of their telephone numbers. Oh, the, the, I don't even know what we're talking about, Danny. I'm so sorry. I'm so, I know, look, this episode is like 90% me. It's just invited so many rants. I don't know why. I apologize, listeners. Most of you are probably not listening anymore or watching. This is a video. Get your shit together, Simon. The navigation minefield. We're talking about this. We're talking about this. This is the one I mentioned at the beginning with the roads and you know how to, you don't need to know this. Grumpy old people will tell you that youngsters today have lost all basic navigation skills and wouldn't know what to do with a paper map or a compass. They may have a point. A recent detailed study revealed that well over half of millennials admit that they would struggle to find their way without their mobile phone, whilst 15% have never looked at a traditional map, a paper map, in their lives. Which is insane. I used to do like cadets as a kid, like Navy cadets, and so we had to go out into like wilderness without any electronics and sh And they'd be like, okay, you got to navigate yourself on this map and as soon as this like a mate of mine had like one of those um it was like this gps thing that it had on his boat or whatever and it would just it was like giant brick of a thing with a screen on it and it would just tell you your gps coordinates but you could work out where you were on the map by using those so we'd just sneak that onto every trip because we didn't want to do like you know okay there's a church over there and there's a steeple a church with a steeple over there and you'd be like doing the triangle thing so like i'm sure i could still do it to find out where you are and we were just like yeah but let's just look it up on the thing and we did, and it was great. Naturally, it's much easier and quick to plot out your route these days using digital maps and GPS. Most of the time, anyway. We are still occasionally hear comical stories, such as one from 2013, when, the six when a 67-year-old Belgian woman named Sabine Moreau programmed her sat-nav for a 38-mile journey to pick up her friend from a train station, and someone ended up going on a 900-mile detour across five borders without ever suspecting that something might have gone wrong. Not sure what happened to her friend at the train station. 900 miles! You're going 38 miles, isn't there a Point where you're topping up your car like three times and you're like this doesn't seem correct <laughs> again the concern is the millennials are going to be running around like headless chickens if they can't use phones or sat navs during the zombie apocalypse that is like but this is again it's like the least thing i'm going to be worrying about in a zombie apocalypse i'm going to be worried about the zombies what do you think i like turtles 
All right, you're a great zombie. Having said that, I'm pretty sure those grumpy old people used to be grumpy young people when it came to studying a paper map. I'm not sure I've seen a discussion involving two people and a map which didn't descend into a fierce argument about what the strange fish symbol is supposed to represent and why there appears to be a nature reserve slap bang in the middle of the next dual carriageway. There are still some advantages of using a paper map. For example, you can get a much bigger sense of your overall surroundings, which just is impossible on a restricted view of a small screen. But before the grumpy old people get too high and mighty, here's another thought. Was it actually the widespread use of paper maps that led to the human race losing some of our basic navigation skills? Maps have been around for thousands of years, but they were harder to come by back in the day when you couldn't just pick up a mass-produced map from the 24-hour garage. And not all of them were terribly accurate or helpful anyway, so it was quite common just to get by without. Holy Jesus! What is that? If you go way back to the Middle Paleolithic era, Jesus Christ, we are going way back, Danny. Evidence has shown that humans were willing to travel across hundreds of miles of unfamiliar terrain and successfully making the return home, all without the aid of a cheat sheet map. That all sounds pretty impressive, considering that I'd be hopelessly lost to death if I accidentally took a wrong turn on my way home from the local pub. It's been suggested that humans used to have an innate sense of direction, which has become diluted over time. And it's maybe not such an outlandish theory. Recent scientific experiments from 2010 concluded that baby rats are born with an innate sense of direction as they always seem to get back on the right track independently of any experience of their environments but the human race also picked up several other navigational tricks along the way which have largely fallen by the wayside such as using the sun moon and the stars or leaving a waypoint markers in the form of artwork or bent over trees pointing in the right direction of course one method which never went out of fashion is just stopping to ask for directions the epic travels of marco polo were helped along by this strategist asking the locals the right way to the next caravan holiday park ah oh, yes marco polo and his famous caravan holiday i'm particularly fascinated though with the strategy used by certain apache tribes in the 19th century which harks back, harks back to the mnemonic devices of the memory palace when a young apache male was on the brink of coming of age he would be expected to travel hundreds of miles to carry out a raid on a village that he never visited his map would be nothing more than a stick an elder would sit down with a stick and explain the long winding route to the young male at each significant turn along the route he would cut a notch in the stick to represent the change in direction the young man would then practice the route by reciting the directions while running his hands up and down the stick perform a tactile association with the notches and turn the stick into a crucial traveling aid for the journey that's pretty clever to be honest the interesting point here is that we can be critical today of how the human race relies so deeply on the storage of information of information on technology and yet these apaches were effectively transferring data onto a backup device back in the 19th century to create a very early version of the memory stick but a bomb bomb I suppose the difference is that following a global catastrophe, uh, you're going to still be able to find plenty of sticks, but not so many working sat-navs. Not that we'll be able to use the memory stick method anyway today. If you remember, we've forgotten how to train our memories. Maybe we're better off hoping the Earth just doesn't get hit by a solar flare in our lifetime. Yes, big fingers crossed. That Carrington event from like the late 19th century was like this thing where it like this big solar flare happens, and if that happened today, it'd be like, whoa, sh and uh, let's just keep our fingers crossed that that doesn't happen again. I'd like to see those Apaches change attire, though. Thank you for watching. Maybe I've got access to future technology. No, I don't think so.